Good morning. My name is Van Donkerskid and I am the Vice President of UANA from the United States. And I am pleased to welcome you this morning to the session titled Navigating Identity Through Swimming. Uh, very, very pleased this morning to um, introduce our presenter, who is a dear friend of mine, um, Naomi Grandpierre. Uh, Naomi and I met uh, probably back in sometime around 2012 or 13 um, at the United States uh, Aquatic Sports Convention um, as colleagues representing our respective local swimming committees uh, to that convention. And uh, since then, Naomi and I um, become close friends and uh, are very, very much uh, excited today to be uh, working and presenting this presentation to you all. Um, Naomi and I have had the opportunity over the last several years uh, to see each other um, through our travels at many different competitions. Uh, the last one that I can think of that we, we saw each other in Aruba, um, at the CC Can Championships uh, two years ago. So with that, I, I would like to introduce Naomi Grandpierre. Naomi is uh, the first female Olympic swimmer and the youngest inductee into the 1804 list of Haitian American change makers. She is uh, Canadian born, raised in, in the United States, but Haitian. She swam professionally for 13 years and over 10 international competitions for Haiti, including the 2016 Olympic Games. She's traveled to more than 20 countries. She act actively vlogs her adventures on the undercurrent. Certainly check out her YouTube channel after this. She refuses to accept the limiting frameworks of socially constructed boxes and defines herself by an array of interests and passions. Her current focus looks to blend psychology and marketing to create influential content within forward-thinking workspaces. She is the uh, team captain for the Haitian National Swim Team, project manager for Road to Tokyo Project, a member of our very own Ioana Athletes Committee, and in her professional life, she is a strategist at Bright House, which is a BCG company. She's an unpublished author, entrepreneur, and active public speaker, and she will be presenting today on navigating identity through swimming. And without further ado, Naomi Grandpierre. Awesome. Thank you, Van, for that awesome introduction, and it's good to see you. Unfortunately, it's virtual, but it's been cool to kind of see you at different events all over the world. And thank you to everyone that's tuned in today. We're gonna to have a great time. I'm excited to share this content with you guys. And please keep the questions coming in because we will make time at the end to um, answer a few questions. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So just give me one second. Awesome, let me present. All right, Van, you'll let me know. Can you see my screen? Everything looking good? Great, let's get started. So today we're going to talk identity, what it is, how to navigate it, and how it affects your life both in and out of the water. So as Van mentioned, my name is Naomi, and all these things that he listed make up my identity, including the fact that my favorite color is sunlight green, which is just a really fun fact. It makes me happy. And I want to talk a little bit more about the little things that people may not know about you, but how it does shape your identity and impacts how you move through the world. Identity is a huge part of your life experience. It dictates how you see the world and how the world sees you. It is made up of what other people say about you and what you say about yourself. And so today we're going to see how many parts of identity, how the many parts of identity matter to you as an athlete. So let's begin. What is identity? We know the guy on the left is Jamaican and the girl in the middle is American and the guy on the right is por or, um, from Portugal. Um, though they all come from different parts of the world, they have a shared identity. They are all professional athletes. 
We know a few other things about their identity. The super fast track runner is Usain Bolt. The incredibly fast distance swimmer is Katie Ledecky. And the super talented soccer player is Cristiano Redondo. But there is a lot more to identity than what lies on the surface. There's what you show outwardly to others. There's what others say about you, but there's also what you think about yourself, your personal relationships. For example, while we all see Usain Bolt being a superstar athlete, we sometimes forget that part of his identity is that he's a son or he might be a boyfriend to somebody. Or same thing with Katie Ledecky. She is a daughter and has a, and is a sister. She has a brother. Or same with Cristiano Ronaldo. He's a husband and a father. So in the age of social media, it is important to understand the difference between your public identity and your private identity. For example, for me, after I finished walking through the opening ceremonies at the 2016 Olympic Games, my Instagram went from 1,000 followers to 12,500 followers overnight. It was crazy and I didn't know what to do about it. So out of nowhere, I had to quickly figure out how to navigate with this public platform as like a professional Olympic athlete. So as you can see here, there's Katie Ledecky in her personal life, just having fun. And there are things that like, we don't get to know about her, but maybe her family gets to know or her personal friends or just how she navigates through life. And then there's your public identity. So there's what we see on TV. There's what we see on Google. There's your Wikipedia page. And then there's your Instagram. So your social media is how you can share with the world who you are and what you wanna share publicly or privately. And understanding how to navigate that is important. So for me, once I got all those followers, I made sure to create a private Instagram for my close friends where I can just like be fully myself and then have a public page where I can talk about my endeavors with Haiti swimming, when I travel, and that's what I do on my YouTube channel as well. So social media is obviously a really fun way to share parts of yourself. Um, and so we're gonna talk more about the, the real definition of identity. So what is identity? Identity includes the many relationships people cultivate, such as their identity as a child or a friend, a partner and a parent. It involves external characteristics over which a person has little or no control. For example, your height or your gender, your race, socioeconomic class. Identity also encompasses your mental attitude. So what you think, what you believe in, how you're raised, if you have religious um, beliefs, and it impacts every single decision you make every single day. So I'm sure you were wondering what all this has to do with swimming. Turns out identity impacts swimming tremendously. Let's take my Olympic heat. Uh, at the 2016 Olympic games, I swam the 50 meter freestyle. And everyone had to bring different parts of their identities into that heat. For example, in this first thought bubble, say the girl was coming from a refugee country and so she was swimming under the Olympic flag. I'm sure that significantly impacts her identity and how she's feeling before the competition. I'm sure she's nervous, maybe has a lot of anxiety about not knowing what's going on back home, but she's here at the race and she's ready to go. Or maybe the second thought bubble is, as a female, sometimes you've got things going on in your body and your stomach hurts, you're cramping, but you still have to show up for the race. But that part of your identity is significantly impacting how you're feeling. Or take me right here. I was freaking out because no one had ever swam for Haiti before as a female. And I was doing something that no one had done before. So while I was like physically ready to go in my head, like I was super scared, I was really nervous. And then say the girl next to me is just feeling really good. She's supported and she just wants to break her national record. So as you can see, everyone is kind of bringing different personalities, different identities into the race. And while we're all swimmers and we're all athletes competing at the same competition, our identities are very different. And so we're gonna talk more about that. I'm sure you guys have all heard the quote, swimming is 90% mental and 10% physical. Now, while this hasn't been scientifically proven, I'm sure you all know what I mean when you say that you talk to yourself at practice. Whether it's counting the breaths or counting the laps, encouraging yourself to push through even though you're tired, your physical ability can only take you so far as a swimmer. And at the end of the day, the difference between who can do an extra dolphin kick in that 200 meter butterfly is all about your mental training. 
So I want to ask you, is your mind full or are you being mindful? And so as you can see, these two thought bubbles are two completely different things and they're happening for the same person. And you can choose to either have a mind full of thoughts, full of anxieties, always going all over the place, or you can have a very calm mind that's enjoying the current experience and helping you go through it. So again, I'm sure the first image you get in your head when you think about mindfulness is a Tibetan monk sitting at the top of a mountain. But mindfulness applies to everyone, especially swimmers. So mindfulness means maintaining a moment by moment awareness of your thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations and surrounding environment through a gentle and nurturing lens. So if we take that into swimming and if you're at a competition, it's about how you're feeling. You have that really tight suit on, you might be feeling really loose or maybe you're still sore from all those hundreds you did a week ago. Is your mind going all over the place? Are you feeling calm? Are you taking deep breaths? Is it cold? Is the water too hot? All these things and all of those things affect you and what's going on in your head. So mindfulness also involves acceptance, meaning that you pay attention to your thoughts and how you're feeling, but you don't judge them without believing, for instance, that there's a right or wrong way to feel in the given moment. Because say you trained five months for a competition and you're just feeling horrible, your body doesn't feel right. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's right or wrong, because at the end of the day, you got to swim your race. But what you can make sure that you're doing is that you're being mindful. Because when we practice mindfulness, our thoughts tune into what we're sensing in the present moment, rather than rehearsing the past or imagining the future. So again, how does this translate? Do you think Michael Phelps had his mind full or was being mindful during his gold medal race? I bet you that Michael Phelps was being mindful. His head wasn't clouded with negative self-talk or distracting thoughts. He had a laser sharp focus on being mindful and positive no matter what he was feeling during the race. And that takes a lot of practice to be this mindful, especially in a 200 meter butterfly. So I want you to ask yourself this, when you're at practice or when you're at a competition, what is going on in your head? Are you screaming at yourself? Oh, I need to breathe. My body hurts. Oh my God, he beat me on the term. My coach is going to be so disappointed. And are you just spiraling, spiraling, spiraling? Or during your race, are you talking to yourself? I'm right on pace. I trained for this. I'm ready. I'm relaxed. Gold medal. Here I come. This is where mental health is super important. So our minds are tools that our body cells create in order to help us live. Minds look forward and back. They predict what will happen on the basis of what has happened already. They calculate options and risk and all in the service of keeping our bodily selves moving, creating and thriving for who we are. So for example, at practice, I know you look at the clock all the time and your mind is helping you get through the training. It's like, okay, I got to take these amount of breaths. I got to do this turn right. And all these things are constant thoughts that are going through your head. Now, a healthy mind is one that helps us embrace our experiences as occasions to discover the range and reach of what our body knows. A healthy mind helps us move through life experiences. It helps us understand our personal emotions and what is going on all around us. So let's look at these two pictures. Let's start with me, for example. This first picture is when I first looked at my time after my Olympic race. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I was really disappointed. I touched the wall. I felt like my finish wasn't very good. I saw that the girl next to me out touched me and I really wanted to win my heat. So I came second and I didn't go the time that I wanted. And I was like, oh, like this sucks. But then I realized that I was in charge of how my mind was. And this was still an incredible experience I had made history for Haiti. And so very quickly, I was like, you know what, let me put a smile on my face and enjoy this moment because I'm really, really happy right now. And athletes go through this all the time, whether you're a gold medalist or just someone in a heat, Michael Phelps, for example, there are races where he feels super, super good and super happy, or there are other times when he's just super disappointed. And how you can help control these things is how you talk to yourself. And so we're going to talk a little bit about self-talk. So many people are conscious of this inner voice that you have in your head, and it's just a monologue that helps you go through your day. This inner voice or self-talk is a combining of conscious thoughts and unconscious beliefs and biases, and it kind of helps your brain interpret what is going on. 
your self-talk can either be cheerful and supportive or negative and self-defeating. But self-talk can be very beneficial when it's positive. It can calm your fears. It can make you feel confident. But by human nature, unfortunately, sometimes you're prone to just negative self-talk. So you're always saying things like, I can't do anything right, or I'm a complete failure, or I'm not going to go the best time today. And so understanding that you do have self-talk and you are 100% in control of what your mind is telling you during the day, during practice, during a competition is super important. So a negative or a positive mindset is literally only one decision or one thought away. And I want you guys to understand this. So say you show up to practice, it's 5 a.m. You're really not feeling it. You literally can decide, am I going to have a bad attitude today at practice? Or I'm already up, it's 5 a.m., the water's freezing cold, but I'm going to get the best out of this practice today. So literally, you can either snip that I can't from I can do it, or you can decide just to leave it there and have that negative mindset. So how can we improve our self-talk and our mindset to make sure that it's serving us in the sport? So as an athlete, mental health needs are super important and it's just as important as your physical needs. Both contribute to optimizing your overall well-being and your performance. During high performance and the elite athlete phase, coaching relationships are important, environments are important, your training is important, but what's most important is your mental health and your well being. So, a safe and inclusive swimming environment ensures that both you and your fellow athletes can maintain positive experiences within the sport, both in training and in competition off deck. So let's remember how we were referencing Michael Phelps in that 200 meter butterfly. It takes a lot of practice for you to be in a competition as difficult as the 200 fly and have your brain be super chill the whole time. You're hurting, your lungs hurt, your legs hurt, and you're like, you got this, you got this. And Simone Manuel probably does this really well at practice. Practices are hard, but she needs to help her brain understand that even though it's hard, positive thoughts all the time. You got this, Simone. You're killing it. Your legs are good. Your flip turn was strong. And if you're constantly having positive self-talk at practice, you're very easily going to be able to do that at competition without having that much effort. So I'm, I'm hoping this video works, but I want to show this video and then kind of talk about something more along the lines of identity. So Van, I want to see um just like my, maybe just text me if the audio isn't working i hope you guys are able to see this This ain't some issue within my lifetime, my light shine bright. Protect your energy from poison when them pythons strike. My first mistake was doing robberies on icon bikes. Watch my moves and I'ma show you what an icon like. I've just been itching to prove myself. I just pray throughout the struggle, I don't lose myself. Awesome. So obviously this is a Beats commercial, but the reason why I showed you guys this is because this is Naomi Osaka. I'm sure you guys all have heard about her and she is an icon in the tennis world. But part of her identity, which is interesting because she's half Japanese and half Haitian and I'm Haitian as well. But part of her identity is she's just a very quiet and soft-spoken person. But as a black person navigating this very tricky year of 2020, when there are a lot of Black Lives Matter protests, she wanted to do something about it and use her identity and use her athlete platform to share her voice. But again, like I said, part of her identity is just being soft-spoken. So this ad does a really good job of showing how you can be really creative in your identity and how you express yourself to let other people know what's going on in your world. So, so though she doesn't like say anything out loud, her braids say silence is violence. And so everybody that sees her can recognize that she is supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. And she's making sure that the space that she's in recognizes who she is and what her identity is and what her struggles are. Because at the end of the day, all of those struggles that are happening outside of the sports arena do show up to the competition. And you wanna make sure that your identity feels supported wherever you go. So let's see if I can, okay, perfect. So how is identity expressed or suppressed? 
here, for example, we have the basketball team and they're all wearing Black Lives Matter shirts. And during the national anthems, they decide to take a knee in solidarity for all people who share the black identity and are trying to share to other people who aren't black, how it is to experience the world within this identity. And so it's really important that within the sports world, we're doing everything we can to ensure that we are in an inclusive environment. For example, when I'm walking through the Olympic Village, all the shirts that I wear say Haiti on it. And if you're from another country, it'll say China, it'll say Fiji, it'll say Antigua, and everyone's walking around with different, uh, their different country's swag. What would be horrible is if I went up to another person and they weren't wearing the same country shirt as me and I was like, you don't deserve to be here or I think your country is horrible. That's not creating an inclusive environment and that's negatively affecting the person in front of me's mindset because remember identity has a lot to do with how you talk to yourself and how you see yourself but also the feedback that you get from other people in the world strongly affect your identity. And you wanna make sure that everyone around you is feeling very good and positive in their identity. Because again, remember that picture I showed you guys of when everyone is ready to hit up the heats. There are so many different identities in all those 10 lanes coming together to swim. And you wanna make sure that no one has an unfair advantage because someone feels really good in their skin while someone else doesn't. So why is being inclusive so important? Because again, identity is not all about what you see on the surface. It's about what's going on inside. It's about your thoughts. It's about your feelings. So let's take practice, for example. You see the yellow arrow? Maybe this girl is feeling super happy at practice today. She doesn't necessarily have to share that with anybody. That's just how she's feeling inside. So her happiness is definitely affecting her thoughts. So she's probably like, oh, I love this set. I'm so excited. My times are on point. I'm right on pace. And she is wanting to just feel that happiness during practice. But say the person right next to her in this red arrow is feeling really sad. Say something in their personal life happened, like their best friend is really, really sick and they still wanted to show up at practice, but they're just not doing really well that day. It's important for the girl next to him who's super happy to make sure that she's being mindful and aware that maybe the person next to him to her is not feeling the exact same way that she is. And she wants to make sure that she's still being supportive and inclusive to the person, um, whether it's your enemy and not necessarily your enemy, but like the person that you're competing with that day or just your teammate or the person sharing a lane with you. You just want to make sure that you're being inclusive to whatever that person is feeling. Because again, the person in the lane next to you could be feeling super anxious. Maybe they have a test the next day and they just don't feel really good about science and they don't want to share that that's part of their identity. They struggle with school, but it's just something that's going on in their mind while they're swimming. And maybe the person next to him is just feeling fine and he doesn't really wanna talk about anything. So it's really important to know that how you carry yourself and your identity also affects other people's identity. So what does being inclusive mean? It means inviting and ensuring access, a safe and welcoming environment, partnership opportunities and leaderships for people of all backgrounds, communities and identities. This might relate to a person's race, ethnicity, nationality, religious identity, immigration status, and the list goes on. It's just important to make everybody feel welcomed and included. So being authentic is probably one of the most important things about identity. Authenticity is the cornerstone of mental health. It correlates to many aspects of psychological well-being, including your self-esteem and how you cope with life. Acting in accordance with one's core self and beliefs, which is called self-determination, is ranked by some experts as being one of the three basic psychological needs of everybody, along with competentness, competence and a sense of relatedness. So here you see me, I'm at a competition. I think this was when I was in Budapest and I'm just having so much fun. Like, yeah, I'm a swimmer. Yeah, I have a lot of um, races to get to, but I feel free and able to express myself, represent the Haitian flag, the fact that I'm a black swimmer in another country that's not mine. And why is that? Because 
all the other swimmers that were on deck made me feel great. We were all really friendly with each other. I didn't feel ashamed to be wearing my Haitian uniform, even though I was one of the only Haitians there. And that's what we want to make sure that our sport is looking like. So no matter what your identity is, you're feeling really good and your mental health is right on track. So that's really all I have for my presentation. So I am happy to either like share, answer questions, talk through what, where all these pictures are from, but I appreciate all of you guys tuning in and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Naomi, thank you. What an excellent presentation. Uh, a, a very interesting uh, way to think about identity um, as it relates to sport in a way that I certainly have never thought of it. So, so thank you for that. Um, we do have um, a few questions that have come in. Uh, so I'm gonna start with um, the first question comes from Nadine Day. Um, did you have a mentor Sure, that's a great question. So I'd say my mentors kind of come from a lot of different people. And something I share about my Olympic story is I had a dream. I, I just wanted to go to the Olympics. I was super inspired by Cullen Jones at the 2008 Olympics. And that was what I wanted to do. And I started sharing that dream with different people. And immediately, so many people like in my classroom were like, oh, that's crazy. Like you could never do that. And I was like, oh my God, like everyone's being super negative. So I was very, very particular about who I chose to share that dream with. And those are who I would say my mentors are. So both of my parents were super supportive and they definitely mentored me through the entire process, making sure that my mindset was positive and supportive. My coach was super influential as a mentor and in making me believe in myself, be confident and just trust my training. And then I had these big celebrities like Simone Manuel was a huge mentor, just watching her story as being a, a history maker for black swimmers or Colin Jones or even international swimmers that I got to see doing their thing. So my mentors kind of came from all over and I would highly suggest for you to like follow people on Instagram who inspire you, who have the life that you want. And you can literally scroll all the way down to the bottom of their timeline and see what is it that they did. So for example, for me, like I had no idea how I was going to represent Haiti. It had never been done before. We didn't even know what the qualifying procedure was like, but I studied Michael Phelps, Cullen Jones, Simone Manuel, and they were really inspiring to me. And they definitely helped me as well as my coaches and my parents um, get through the journey. Thanks, Naomi. I've got a couple of questions coming in here that have a similar uh, a theme. So what is um, your recommendations and, and your thoughts on um, mental health uh, and, and mental health, particularly for high performing athletes that are retiring from sport and how specifically they can take care of themselves um, as they make that transition to retirement? Yeah, that's a great question. And I do want to share that I, I've taken a break from my vlog, The Undercurrent, but I am planning on starting that back up next month. And that is a topic that I want to talk in depthly about because that mental journey is so, so difficult and it's not being talked about enough. So I just retired swimming March of last year, right when COVID started. And it's really difficult. I swam for 13 years. It was a huge part of my life. I would wake up at 5 a.m. I would go to the pool in the evening and it was just like part of my life. And then I stopped swimming and the way I had to eat changed, the way I navigated my life changed, my mental health changed. And it's, it's just very difficult. And it, it has a lot to do with identity as well. Being an athlete, especially being a swimmer makes up a huge part of your identity because it's just what you do literally every day. So when you take that activity away, it's kind of like, oh my God, who am I? What am I supposed to do with myself? Like, 
am I still like a, a human being? Like, I just don't know. And it's like, it's really scary and it's really hard. And it's something that I would love the swimming community to kind of come together and figure out. And I know Michael Phelps has done a really good job being open about his mental health struggles because it's a very vulnerable thing. And most people don't want other people to know that they're struggling, but the reality of it is it's super normal. Everyone goes through it. And even if you're still a swimmer, like going through that plateau phase, sucks and like how do you deal with that and that mental health battle like you're constantly dealing with those negative thoughts and if, if we all come together and just share our experiences and talk about it we'll all be able to get through it together great question yeah no certainly and and I think that uh it's it's salient you know uh what Michael has been doing you know and how that speaks uh, to, to all aquatic sports athletes and all, you know, I think all high performing athletes across all, um, all sports. So, um, moving on to the next question, uh, coming from Audrey Grandpierre, um, have you ever been in a, a, a space, uh, whether in sport or outside of sport that you did not feel included? That's a great question. Um, yes, it happened several times, honestly. Um, I, will say that I'm very proud of the progress that the sport of swimming has made in terms of making sure that swimming is more diverse and that there are more representations of non-white athletes. Um, but yeah, plenty of times. For example, when I first popped onto the international scene um, around like 2016, I would go to competitions and I would be wearing the Haiti um, shirt on my like just throughout the competition and people would give me dirty looks all the time like oh my god like Haiti like what are you doing here and it l did not make me feel good at all and so remember that photo I showed you guys of like how people could be feeling internally and how it affects your mental health so that was an added stress to me that most athletes probably didn't have to face where like I had to keep talking extra, extra positive to myself where it's like, don't worry about what they're saying. Like, be confident. You're here to swim. Don't like, you don't have to think about other people's opinions. And that was back at a time where like swimming was not as inclusive as it is now. But I will say that as things have progressed, like it's very easy to make friends from different countries now and to share your experiences. And just because you're different doesn't mean that you're like weird or anything like that. But it was definitely very, very hard. And it affected my mental health tremendously when other people who are the majority in the spaces just don't make you feel welcome. So it's something we all should work on. Great. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question here comes from... Um, Polina Salazar, um, how hard is it for athletes to open up to others to let them know what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's going to start by being really hard, but conversations like these help to improve the experience. So the fact that all of you guys are tuning in and wanting to learn about how to better improve your relationship with yourself and navigating your own identity, and then making sure that other people around you are feeling good. And it could be literally as simple as you see someone behind the blocks and you've never spoken to them before. But as a swimmer, you know that it's really scary to be behind the block. You could literally just go, hey, I see that you're nervous. Good luck. And like that can make the person feel so good because it's like, wow, you really see me. And like, I've never seen you before, but like you understand what I'm going through. And the more people open up about it. So I'll share with you guys for about two years in my swimming career, my self-talk was so, so negative. Like it was not good. My mental health was not healthy at all. I would go to practice and I was like constantly beating myself up, like kind of like yelling at myself. Like I couldn't breathe. And I'm like, no, Naomi, like you have to finish, like to finish strong. Like, and it was just not a positive experience at all. And I realized how much it was affecting me negatively. And I was like, I have to change this. So I would come to practice like five minutes early and I would just sit and breathe and be like, okay, Naomi, we're gonna get ready for practice. It's gonna be super hard, but it's only two hours and you're gonna get through it. And I realized that I was getting through it and it was getting easier. And it was because I was talking to myself nicer. And so these are conversations that you can bring up to your coach and as athletes, it's important that we share what's going on. So for example, if you let your coach know, it's like, hey, I've really been struggling with my mental health. 
do you mind if we take like 10 minutes before practice to just form a circle and we all just like share what's going on in our worlds and like kind of creating spaces like that. And you as an athlete, you can use your voice and like share that with your coach and be like, Hey, like, I just want to check in with everyone and see how we're feeling. Like, how can we go through this 200 set and make sure that we're all being positive, even though our, we're tired and we're burnt out, like making sure that you're really helping yourself through the set rather than beating yourself up. Great. Thank you. We've got a really interesting question. I think that, um, uh, is coming from, uh, Christina Rios. Um, what advice can you give to uh, Latin American females who feel that they're not as good as other females from potentially stronger countries? Yeah, I understand that question 100%. And I'll just share my personal experience. So literally being the only female swimmer in my country, it was very difficult. And then when you go to these like huge international competitions and you see these like really established teams, like all the girls from the United States, they're super big. They have a lot of support. They have all the money. They have the coolest new suits. They've got best training. And you're here like, oh, like, what am I doing here? Like, do I deserve to be here? You do. And I know like it might be scary and you might feel like you're alone. Cause I definitely felt like I was alone. Cause I didn't have like any female teammates with me, but realizing that there are other female athletes in other countries who may feel like they're alone. But if we all come together and realize that we're not alone, we're breaking barriers. We're helping the next generation of female athletes feel safe and included in their spaces. So for example, we now have three female athletes on the Haitian team, and I'm making sure that their experience is 100% positive and they don't have to go through like the weird things that I had to go through, but also use social media, like find swimmers. And I think like the swimming community can definitely do a better job of highlighting other international swimmers who are might who may not necessarily be like the record holders or like the super famous ones, but like what's the what's the female swimmer from Antigua doing? What's the female swimmer from, I don't know, Seychelles doing? Like there are so many countries around the world and making sure that there is that equal representation and that feeling of inclusiveness for guys and girls is super important. And as a UANA athlete representative, I'm gonna make sure that you guys start to feel, you know, more included in these spaces. Yeah. No, let's, and let's, let's put a pin in that one. I mean, that's, I think, as you and I have discussed and, and something that we've we've discussed extensively at the leadership level, right? It's just how can we how can we publicize what's going on, you know, throughout all of the countries, right? And making sure that that information and and we're celebrating those successes, right? Um, so uh, quick one here. Um, we've got some uh, folks in the audience from our, our, our master's community. Uh, they'd like to know uh, when you're committing to um, participating in master's events now. That That's a great question. So I will say I am definitely on the tail end of the transition process of like not being a swimmer, or like being a swammer. And so, and to share this quite openly with everyone, it definitely took like a solid year of like, mentally transitioning out of swimming so it's probably going to be a minute but I'm sure there'll be a I'll reach a point where like you know I really miss the sport and I'm like oh like I would love to get back in the water um so it's I don't know when but I'm sure there'll be a point where you know I, I really miss it and I, I want to reconnect with my swimmer identity but I'm enjoying doing different things now well certainly I know that they, they're an eager group to welcome you so of course uh, yes I'm excited. Uh, okay hey, next would be uh, and just dovetailing off of that last discussion we were having about media um yeah. you think it, it do you do you believe that it would be beneficial for uh our athletes to to receive social media uh, and or media training yeah definitely so the most recent competition or I guess Uana event I went to was in Peru and Uana put on an amazing training on social media and it was just kind of walking very young athletes through what happens because for me I got no training at all I just like went to the opening ceremonies went to sleep woke up and I had like a massive following on Instagram and I was like okay like what do I do with this and also like 
understanding your identity. So for example, my sister, she was also on the Haitian swim team and she is not into social media. She doesn't want to be a public figure. And that was something she said straight up. She was like, if I'm on the Haitian national team, I don't want a public Instagram. I don't want people to know who I am. I just want to go and swim and that's it. And so kind of understanding what it is that you want to do and how you want to use your platform. So for me, I love sharing my experiences and making sure that you as an athlete feel heard. We talk about things that no one wants to talk about because they're just important, which is why like I'm totally comfortable like vlogging, using my YouTube channel, sharing on Instagram, and even like on a larger level, like I've been using my Instagram to help people see that Haiti isn't this like super poor third world country that's dangerous like there's so much beauty about the country that people don't know about and sharing that so I think social media training is super important but it's something that you can kind of train yourself like there are so many people on Instagram that you can study from which is like the coolest part about the platform great I mean awesome um and certainly something that I think we're we're looking forward to um developing more uh, through the, the WANA platform. So um, pivoting here a little bit to talk a little bit more to our, our, our coaches in the audience, maybe putting your, your, your athlete coach perspective hat on here. Um, should coaches take on um, more of a role in uh, developing uh, athletes psychologically? Um, understanding what's going on in their lives, what might be going on um, for them emotionally and addressing those, uh, those types of things with their athletes? Yes, the answer is 100% yes. And I would love to just have like a coaching session where we just, you know, share the athlete perspective on the sport and figure out how the coach athlete relationship can make sure that the mental health side of things is fully addressed. Because like I said, like, mental training is such a huge, huge part of swimming. And as coaches, you guys know this, it's about like keeping track of your times, counting your breaths, counting your strokes, counting your underwaters. Like that's so much mental effort. And that's something that's not being talked a lot about. Like there's the physical exertion that you put into your trainings and say you're training like 10 days a week or, or 10 times a week. But then there's also that mental stress, like keeping track, keeping track of your pace, talking to your lungs, telling them to calm down. Like this is just like a level of elite mental dialogue that most people just aren't experiencing. And it's very unique to swimming and coaches have such a huge role in that because the way I see swimming, it's, it's a lot about pain tolerance. And like, as a coach, when you're writing a set, you should always have your athletes mental health in mind. Like how difficult was the set yesterday? How are they feeling? Have they mentally recovered? Should we take five minutes in practice to literally just breathe together, go underwater, feel good, clear your head. All right, guys, the set is going to be super tough, but we're going to get through it together. And then we're going to have some fun, you know, balancing it out. So it's not a negative mental experience, but the, the physical training is also being, you know, complemented by the mental aspect of the sport and maybe having that open dialogue with your athletes to to just like check in be like hey guys like how are you feeling in the season are we like really tired and down should we just have a fun day maybe incorporating meditation and yoga into your classes because at the end the end of the day a healthy and happy swimmer they're going to perform at their peak. If they reach that state of mental flow where they go into the water, they're feeling good, they're mindful rather than their minds being full of anxiety and stress, they're automatically going to do better. And I've heard this so many times, like athletes go their best times when they weren't even thinking about it. They literally touch the wall and they're like, I had so much fun. Look up. I just went the best time of my entire life. And what was different from that race than any other race it has nothing to do with any physical difference. It's all the mental, like they were literally having fun. They had a clear head and they were just vibing in the water, feeling good. And we want to make sure that more athletes are feeling that way because we're just going to improve performance. So, so awesome. And, um, I'm just gonna, I'm going to stitch a few of the questions that are coming in kind of following up on, on this coaching perspective um, and the development of, of identity from the coaching standpoint. Um, you know, obviously, I think, as you well know from your psychology background, you know, identity formation starts at a young age, right? So um, I guess walk us through what, 
what tips you have for, for coaches specifically for beginning that identity development at that young age, right? And then carrying that through throughout the athlete's career. Um, and, uh, you know, what tips you might also have for those athletes, maybe a little bit uh, older, right? And um, helping encourage and change uh, identity and uh, how they think about their identity at an old, you know, after identity has been formed, if you will. Yeah, this is a great question. So one of um, the classes I took was childhood development in the classroom. And what we learned is when you're young, you develop your own sense of identity and you tell yourself who you are, but then you look to the world to either confirm or deny that identity you've created in yourself. So say I'm like a five-year-old girl and I'm like, I am so good at swimming. I feel great. And then I'm going to go to my coach and be like, okay, like I think this, so do they think this and say like, I don't know, the five-year-old like messes up the turn is like the coach just doesn't even think about it, but it's like, that's terrible they're going to internalize that and be like, well, I thought I was a good swimmer, but my coach just said I'm terrible. So then my identity must be a lie. And so then they'll change their identity to match what it is that people are telling them. And so it's really important, especially if you're a coach for like younger kids, but for anyone, because identity matters all the time, making sure that you're always being positive, like, because teachers and coaches play such a huge role in forming identity. And it's important to have that awareness. And also understanding your own identity as a coach, because at the end of the day, you've got to recognize your identity as a human being. And what is your relationship with swimming? Oftentimes I found that because before you became a coach as a swimmer, your coach was very hard on you. He made you do like the worst sets ever. Like they were super traumatic, but they turned you into the swimmer that you are. You're super successful. And so in your mind, you're like, okay, well, in, in order to be a good coach, I got to be super hard on my athletes. I got to have these like crazy traumatic sets because that's what makes a swimmer a swimmer. I really want to like push people to start rethinking that like just because swimming was really tough and traumatic for you does not mean this is a cycle we need to continue like we really need to start checking in with our athletes how did you feel after that race like were you confident okay let's talk about why not like why didn't you feel good and maybe it's like well like you know at practice I just haven't been like maintaining my pace so I just felt like I would just wasn't in shape and maybe that's an opportunity for you as a coach to be like your feelings are valid. And yeah, you're right. Like you haven't been holding pace, but today's a new day. Like remember mindset, let's make sure we're being mindful today. Just go and have fun, see what happens. And if you're offering that positive encouragement and you're helping your athlete recalibrate their self-talk, that'll make like all the difference every single time. Awesome. Um, so again, uh, continuing kind of this line of, of questioning about the, the coach's role, um, mm -hmm. Uh, two-part question here. Um, so what effect does body image have on identity, uh, specifically as uh, as we know in, in aquatic sports, because aquatic sports is a bit revealing, right, in that regard. Um, and what, what tools um, can coaches and athletes use to promote positive body image? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a really tough question. And it's something that I think just the swimming community has to figure out together because it's interesting at the end of the day, there is like a look of what like an elite super in shape athlete looks like. And like, we're one of, you know, our bodies are super toned, but what happens if you don't fit that look? How does that make the person feel? How does their identity feel represented? And I'll just take an example. And it's, I guess it still has to do with body image, but for me as a young athlete navigating a very, you know, young swimming community, whenever I looked swimming up on Google, it was always, always white faces. I never got to see a swimmer that looked like me, which has a lot to do with like how I see myself in the mirror. So, you know, I'm putting my cap on, I'm putting my goggles on, I'm putting my swimsuit on and I'm like, all right, well, I'm the only person that looks like me. So here we go. Like normalizing that, or even like, Katie Ledecky is awesome because her body is huge and that's what allows her to be a top performing athlete. And I hope that 
she's felt no shame in how she looks like. And we have made sure to like create an inclusive environment or like let girls know that it's okay to have muscles. Like if you want to be a top performing athlete, you got to be super ripped and super, super, you know, in tone and that's okay. Or like if you're a breaststroker, you're going to have massive shoulders or even like helping swimmers know that there's a look that other humans don't have like we have these massive shoulders we're super tall and lanky which like you know isn't normal when you walk into the classroom but at least when you come on deck it's a very safe and inclusive space especially when it's so revealing and so vulnerable like at the end of the day we're all in swimsuits showing ourselves to everyone and you want to make sure that everyone feels good and confident in their skin great um switching gears a little bit um what, what motivated you not to give up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I feel like swimming is a discipline and whether your self-talk is good or not, we are some of the strongest like minds on the planet. I really think so. Like any athlete, but like swimming is just the next level. So I feel like there's just this determination where it's like, swimmers can go through this two-year plateau, but there's this like, you know, thought in the back of your head where it's like, okay, like I may not be doing well like these two years, but I know I'm grinding at practice and the hard work is gonna pay off eventually. And I think it's just like holding on to that for as long as it's healthy, you know what I mean? And and for me, that was like the that was the tough part for me. Like quitting swimming was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I sat on that thought for like five months, like five months of literally thinking like, this is my entire life. Like, do I want to quit? The Olympic games are just a few months away. Like, how do I want to navigate this? And so really at the end of the day, it's a very individual question. And it has to do with what is your mental health looking like? Is your heart still in it? Are you happy? Are you having fun? And if the answer is like, no, all across the board and you're like miserable in the sport, then maybe it's time to take a step away for a few months because also like some swimmers do incredible if they're plateauing and then you're like, you know what, I'm going to take three months off, have my body and brain take a break, just do something completely different and come back into the water with fresh eyes, fresh mind, fresh body. And then you realize that like, wow, like I'm having so much fun or I'm feeling different or I'm seeing this different. So I think it's definitely a conversation you should have with your coach. And that's another, you know, mental check-in you and your coach, like, Hey coach, like, this is how I'm feeling. What's realistic. What's not. These are my goals. Like, do you think I can reach them or should I change my goals up? And, and having this intellectual conversation, because at the end of the day, swimmers are very intellectual, very intellectual. And it's time that we recognize that. So how do you think that your own personal background um, helped you embrace your identity? Yeah, um, it was very hard. And there were definitely like a lot of journeys. So right before I made the decision to swim at the Olympic level, I went through an identity crisis because my identity is very unique. I was born in Canada. I grew up in America and my parents and my culture is Haitian. So like growing up, I had these like three cultures in my head and I was like, I literally don't know who I am or like where I'm supposed to relate to. And that was like a whole three year like internal battle with myself. And then I finally decided, you know what? well, I'm all three, like I'm Haitian, Canadian, American, and I feel confident in myself and I'll have to just educate other people of who I am. And that's what I did with competing for Haiti. Like I had to step into the room where everybody was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, "Uh, I'll let you know what I'm doing here. I'm a Haitian athlete and I deserve to be here. And I'm, you know, doing something that hasn't been done before, but that took a lot of like self creation of myself. So like, again, when you're younger, like outside opinion matters a lot in shaping your identity. But as you become older, you learn that like, you just have to have your own dialogue with yourself and like not let other people, you know, invade your personal space. And I will also say that like learning psychology and also like understanding the importance of mental health, I brought that into my identity and me just like, you know, sharing my personal experience, I'm hoping is like helping you guys figure out how to navigate your own identities. So for example, I went two years being super, super negative. Like it was very, very toxic, not good. And I had to take some time away from swimming and be like, okay, how am I going to do this? 
And that's when I personally decided to incorporate yoga into my training because my body was hurting all the time. My mind was already like in multiple places. My mind was full all the time. And through yoga, I was able to stretch. I had significant improvements in my swimming because my body felt loose and relaxed. And then also my mind felt clear and calm. So I would go to the race and instead of being like, oh my God, like that person just beat you, like go, go, go. I'm like, no, you got this, like you've trained breathe. It's okay. And something I want to share with swimmers, the best way to practice mindfulness and training is in a hypoxic set. When you're having to hold your breath underwater, it's a hundred percent mental. And it's actually really fun because I'm sure you guys have all experienced it. Your coach is like, okay, do a 25 yard swim underwater. Don't breathe. And you're like, oh my God, how am I going to do that? And so you're underwater and you're literally like this much away from the block, from the wall and you lift your head up to breathe and you're like, oh, I feel so good. And then you're like, wait a minute, my brain just tricked me. I totally could have gone all the way to the end of the wall without breathing and have been fine. So then you do it again and you tell your brain, okay, calm down, it's fine. It's just two more seconds and then you'll be able to breathe. But that self-talk is makes the difference. Like you can either be like, you're almost there, like hold your breath a little longer and your body's like, stop screaming at me. Or you could be like, I know you're hurting, but we're two seconds away and you got this. And you can even translate that in your race. 200 meter butterfly, those last five meters hurt so bad. What is your self-talk looking like? It's like, I'm about to die. Like, this is horrible. I just need to finish. Or it's like, you got this just two more seconds, just breathe in, feel good, relax, relax, relax. And that is what is important. And as coaches, it's important to have that conversation. What is your self-talk in training and in competition looking like? Great. So last question and uh, the production team is telling us we only have about four more minutes left. So um, I just want to get this one last one in because I think it's it's important for the work that we do in Iwana and that you do specifically within the Athletes Commission too. Mm -hmm. um, what advice can you give to young athletes about how to become actively involved in their respective teams, their national federations, beyond into uh, you know, Iwana, FINA, the International Olympic Committee, et cetera. Um, yeah. And, so, uh, and I just want to uh, put in for the viewers, uh, we do have a number of questions that did not get answered. Um, we are capturing those and Naomi and uh, everybody will be, uh, will be producing some answers to those um, and putting them onto the website. And um, also feel free, of course, to follow Naomi on Instagram. Um, and uh, communicate with her that way as well. So Perfect. with that, Naomi, uh, about two minutes to answer that last question and then uh, we'll, we'll close. Sounds great. So yeah, I know this is a conversation that will be ongoing with Van and other members of the UANA committee, but we definitely wanna start opening up access for athletes to share their voice and share their experiences so we can make sure that swimming is a safe and inclusive and representative space for athletes to come together, no matter what country, what gender, what race you are, you just feel supported as a swimmer period, no matter what your identity is. So I'm super committed to doing that. So it literally could be as simple as just sending Yuana a DM, sending me a DM as we work on creating more like legislative structures so we can reach out to each federation and make sure that, you know, every country is represented or is represented within the international organization so we can be like yo how's jamaica doing over there how is the swimmers mental health how can we help you guys improve or how's antigua doing or how's china doing how's um pakistan doing you know and having that check-in where we can all come together as swimmers put aside our individual differences and just make sure that we're all having a positive experience in the sport so to van's point like keep asking your questions keep sending it to you anna we're literally creating UANA for you guys. So all the feedback you give us just helps us make sure that the platform is helping you, that the website is, you know, answering questions, offering the support that you guys need. I'm definitely going to start using the undercurrent again so I can talk about, you know, my transition outside of being an athlete, my past experience, and, you know, helping athletes who are just getting started, making sure that you have all the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the pool. Well, Naomi, it's been a pleasure. Uh, a lot of great feedback coming in as well. Um, 
I think that this dialogue is just getting started. So um, with that, again, thank you so much uh, to you on behalf of Iwana, the Iwana Convention team and the Iwana Executive Committee for the passion that you bring and, uh, and certainly looking forward to continuing the dialogue. So with that, um, we're gonna close uh, this session and stay tuned. Uh, the next session begins at 10.30. Awesome, thank you guys.